Well, good morning, Illuminate, both of those of you that are here and those of you that are online. We're so glad you're with us today. My name is Steve Johnson. I'm one of the pastors uh, here at Illuminate Community Church. And before we get into the book of Genesis, although it may take some of you a way to get there, go ahead and start opening your Bibles to Genesis chapter 26. I, I want to share two things with you. Number one, if you're new here, if you've only been here a month or maybe a couple of months and you still don't know what we're all about, what we believe and all that stuff, I want to invite you to join us for lunch right after service in the youth center for about 45, 50 minutes. Share a little bit about, you can answer, we'll answer as many questions we can about illuminate how we got here, why we're here, etc. So if you're new or relatively new to the church, please stop by the youth center Join us for lunch. We're going to feed you something more than fruit kebabs, um, so you'll enjoy that. Second thing, all of you received a card or you sat on top of a card when you came in this morning. Um, that's an invitation. I want to invite you to join me and one of our key Mideast missionaries, uh, Fred Beasley, on a trip to Israel. We were originally going in November, but because of everything going on in the world right now, we're moving it back to even a better time of year in January. And if you want to talk more about it, stop by the table in the lobby on your way out. We'll be glad to answer some initial questions and then we'll have some meetings about it. But we'd love to have you go with us to experience not only the Holy Land, but more importantly, spend time with and encourage the seven global partners we have in Jerusalem and Bethlehem and in the West Bank. Well, if you have your Bibles open to Genesis 26, when we come to Genesis chapter 26, we basically have a short narrative of Isaac's life. And you know, it's interesting, even though uh, Isaac was the oldest, or he lived the longest of all the patriarchs, almost 180 years, less is recorded about him in the Bible than anybody else um, in terms of the patriarchs. And Genesis 26 is really the only chapter dedicated to his life. We're going to try to run through the chapter today, believe it or not. It's 35 verses. In chapter 25, the previous chapter, we were told of the birth of the twins, Jacob and Esau, to Rebekah and Isaac. And you'll notice in chapter 26 that there's no mention of the twins. And I think there's no mention of the twins because they're not there. I think chapter 26 occurs before the end of chapter 25. Why do I say that? Well, number one, it's hard to imagine, especially the first few verses of chapter 26 occurring if Rebecca and Isaac had twins in tow. You'll see through this chapter, they move three, four, five times. They keep moving, and that would be difficult. But even more importantly, when we get to Isaac repeating the lie of his father Abraham before Abimelech, the the king of the Philistines, it would be really hard for me to believe that Abimelech or anybody else would take uh, Rebekah for anything other than Isaac's wife if there were kids in the house. So I I personally personally think that the children weren't in the picture. Uh, Isaac and Rebecca are are married throughout this story, but it's kind of an insert between chapter 25 and the end of, of chapter 26. And it's interesting that as you look through chapter 26, it reminds us eerily of Abraham's adventures in chapters 12 and in chapter 20. There are a number of striking resemblances or parallels between Abraham and Isaac. Both experienced a famine. They were afraid they were going to be killed on the count of their beautiful wives. And they lied to the king of Gerar, Abimelech. I don't, it could have been his name and it could have been the same guy, both with Abraham and Isaac, even though it occurs 90 years after. But I think it probably Abimelech was a title like king. Um, He was the leader of the Philistines, so whoever the leader was, the two guys both lied. Um, Both Abraham and Isaac prosper and become very wealthy. Both Abraham and Isaac had disputes with Abimelech and the Philistines. And both Abraham and Isaac build altars. And at one point in time, both Abraham and Isaac enter into a treaty with Abimelech at a place called Beersheba. The similarities between Abraham and Isaac's lives are really amazing. But Genesis 26 is just not simply a repeat. What jumps off the text as we look through it are the fact that Yahweh shows up twice and visits Isaac himself. The reiteration of the blessing to his father Abraham is now placed to Isaac. 
And most of all, we see the reality of God's presence throughout all of Isaac's ups and downs in this chapter. You know, we don't talk a lot about the omnipresence or the presence of God. But the reality is, whether you believe in Jesus Christ or not, God is everywhere in every moment in every situation on this planet. You can't get away from him. Uh, one of the greatest sentences, <clears throat> excuse me, and the reality is that he is and will be with you in every moment, in every situation. And one of the greatest sentences in the Bible, one of the longest, is found in chapter one of the book of Ephesians. Go home and read that, that uh, sentence this afternoon. And what you'll dis discover <clears throat> is that even in Christ, God is with you in every moment and every situation, in the Father, in Jesus, and in the Spirit. And how you respond to the presence of God has everything to do with how well you're going to live your life. And that's the, the story that I think that the, the point that we get out of chapter 26 this morning. When we think of God's omnipresence, I think of the psalmist's words in Psalm 139. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where, can I shall, where, where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If, my, if I make my bed in shale, you are there as well. God's presence in chapter 26 is with Isaac all the way through. And it's, in my mind, it's the key to the chapter. Let's look at the text. Verse 1. Now, there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Don't go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands. And I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your, offer, in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So once again, we find ourselves with Isaac this time in the place of famine, no food, the shelves are empty in the stores. And so Isaac decides to do what, he's gonna, what his dad was going to do, and he's going to head towards Egypt. Um, unlike Canaan, which depended on the rainfall from the sky to water the, to provide water to drink and to, to feed the flock, et cetera, and, and grow things, uh, Egypt was, had the Nile River, and so there was plenty of water for all of that. So as Isaac gets ready to go down to Egypt, and he's on the way, he gets as far as Gerar, and the Lord intervenes, and he prevents him from following the same mistake of leaving the promised land, or at least getting too far away from it, that Abraham made. And I think in, in these first few verses, this is the first time that we see that God speaks directly to Isaac. He tells him not to go to, to Egypt. He reiterates the promise that he gave to his father Abraham and stresses the three elements, the land, the seed, and the blessing. And he says, I will be with you. Now, if you look at, at verse 5, that's kind of an interesting phrase. Uh, something surprising happens here. God says that the reason he's going to do all this for Isaac, the reason why he's going to fulfill the promise, and the reason why he's going to be with him is because his father, Abraham, kept my charge, which is to observe whatever God tells you to do, my commandments, which are basically commands that you're obliged to follow, my statutes, which are regulations on how to live life, and my laws, which is the divine instruction or teaching. It's interesting that he says the laws here, even long before we have Moses on Sinai, even before the Ten Commandments, God was writing his law on the heart of the patriarchs. And he did so on the heart of Abraham, and Abraham's obedience, God says, is the reasons why these blessings are going to be on Isaac. Well, why? I think for a couple of reasons. Number one, th this is a reminder that Isaac has done absolutely nothing to deserve these promises of God. 
He did nothing to deserve the blessing with God. And of course, the same is true for us. Again, if you read that long verse, that long sentence in chapter one of the book of Ephesians, you'll see that. And secondly, I think he wants to make sure to reiterate, make sure that Isaac doesn't forget throughout this chapter the words, I'll be with you or I am with you. The text of the entire chapter, Genesis 26, centers around the three instances of God reaffirming his, pro his covenant promises in three different geographical areas, all Evans emphasizing the presence of God and bringing blessing and protection to his chosen people. In verse 3, he says, I will be with you, future. In verse 24, he'll speak again to Isaac a little bit later, and he'll say, I am with you, present. And when Abimelech, Abimelech comes to try to make an oath with Isaac at the end of the, the chapter, we discover that God speaks through Abimelech and says, we recognize that God plainly has been with you in the past. Well, what's so important about the presence of God? What's, present, what's important about the presence of God is that we remember, and you'll probably hear this a couple of times this morning, that God is with you in every moment and every situation. As we move through the chapter, we'll see that God was with Isaac and that today God is even with us in every moment of our weakness, of our success, of our conflict, and even in our heartache. Verses six through 11. So Isaac settled in Gerar, which was south of Gaza, south of the, the promised land, when the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say, my wife, thinking, lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac laughing. And remember that Isaac means laughter, so there's a play on words there. He was laughing with Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, behold, she's your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, because I thought lest I die because of her. And Abimelech said, what is this you've done to us? One of the people might have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people saying, whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Well, it's interesting that uh, in the King James Version, that term laughing there is is translated sporting. So I think that maybe Abimelech saw a little bit was more than going on than just laughing. And whatever this sport was, it's certainly not something that a man should be doing with his sister. So uh, Isaac lies. He compromises. He's weak. And yet God was with him and didn't let him spiral out of control. And that's the great thing about God. God's presence is always there to show us that we are loved, that we, are, we can be forgiven even in our weakest moments. He forgives, and that's why Jesus Christ came to earth and died on the cross, that we might find forgiveness, not just for eternity, but each and every time we get weak. Our sins don't stop God from being good to us and being good towards us as we see in the next few verses because even though he lied and he was weak, God was with Isaac in his success. And we discover in verses 12 through 18 that God is with us even in every moment of your success. Well, duh. I mean, we all think that blessing is material. Go back and read that long sentence in Ephesians chapter 1. It isn't just about material blessing. It's more importantly about spiritual blessing, about understanding what God's presence means and, and living it. And so Isaac show, sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him, and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. I guess rich isn't enough. You've got to be really rich. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us for you're much mightier than we. 
So Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them. And maybe you're wondering, why in the world did God bless Isaac after he disobeys him? Why is it this is recorded right after his sin? Well, I think probably in the whole concept, the whole progress of Revelation, the whole Bible, I think it's to let us know that God's grace is greater than our sin. God loves and forgives in spite of our sin. And this display of God by making him successful is a way of showing Isaac, the people that were living with him, and us that God's covenant promises are based on grace and not upon works. Second, notice that while Isaac, uh, God blesses Isaac materially, the very blessing is also a, becomes a source of discipline because it made the Philistines envy Isaac, and so they started stopping up all the wells. This, this chastening was served to move Isaac ultimately back to the promised land that, that, that he had left where God wanted him. Now, you got to remember in those days, Isaac, Abraham, all the other um, folks that lived in that part of the, the, the world were nomadic herdsmen. They moved from water to water. And for them, water was life. And so these wells that they're talking about in this chapter are not a luxury. They're an absolute necessity. And digging a well was essentially a claim on the land. So if you went and found water, dug a well, set it up, that was like saying, this is my property. But rather than recognize that claim, the Philistines sought to wipe out the claim over and over and over again by filling up the wells that were dug originally by Abraham and then redug by him. And the reality is that God may truly bless us with certain things. He may truly bless you with material success, with temporal blessings, but that doesn't mean that you're not at the same time or sometime later going to face certain trials in conflict as we will see even again in the verses that go ahead. And I think what we'll see in these next verses in the chapter ahead is that God is with you in every moment of your conflict. And I'm sure right now, almost every one of us, maybe not almost everyone, quite a few of us, probably have relationships that are in conflict. Spouses, kids, ex-spouses, co-workers, bosses, maybe even other brothers and sisters in church, there, there's conflict. And you need to recognize that God is with you even in the midst of that. And you don't see the end of where you're going. Verse 19, when Isaac's servants dug the well in the valley and found there a well of spring water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen saying, the water is ours. So he called the name of the well Essek because they contended with them. Then they dug another well and they quarreled over that one. So he called its name Sitna, and he moved from there and dug another well, and they didn't quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, saying, for now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. So you can see Isaac moving from place to place, and yet every time he moved, guess what he found? Water, the blessing of God. The first well, Philistine says, that belongs to us. So he named it contention, Essek, which means contention. They were jealous. The second well, he named Sitna, which means that the, the contention became opposition. And notice that he didn't fight. I would think if you were a nomadic herdsman in the middle of the desert at that time and place, that if they came and, 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 and tried to, to mitigate your claim to your land after you'd spent probably weeks digging a well, that you would put up a fight. This belongs to me. But you know, Isaac doesn't do that. He just moves from well to another place. God allows him to dig, find water. And then finally, he'd gone from Gerar to the Valley of Gerar, kind of like the Valley of L.A., outside of the, 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 main, the main area, he finally finds a spot, probably one of the most extreme spots of the Valley of Gerar, 
And he digs a well, and the Philistines say, we're not going to bother you anymore. And so he names it Rehoboth, which means roominess, okay, because it was far enough not to be a problem where you'd have time and, pl- and, and room to expand and rest and worship. And I think Isaac saw this as a testimony to God's faithfulness and blessing. But you know, and I think between verses 22 and 23, there's kind of a break in, in time because uh, staying in the land of the Philistines in the Valley of Gerar was not God's plan for him. And so we see when, uh, in verse uh, 23, um, if I can find it here in my scriptures, from there it says, he went up to Beersheba, which is, the promise, which is in the promised land. And the Lord appeared to him, second time in the same night and said I am the God of Abraham your father fear not for I'm with you and I will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake so he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants dug a well you know up until this point in time Isaac's decision as to where he should stay and where he should go was basically based on finding water. But it seems to me there's a change here. Having dug a well that they didn't fight over, you would think he would have just settled in the corner of the valley of Gerar at Rehoboth, where there was plenty of room, etc. Instead, we're told in verse 23 that he moves. He moves to Beersheba, which is in the promised land, with no reason stated for the move. So, of course, I ask my question, why? Why would he do that? Why would he give up the comfort and go? And the only answer that I come up with, and this is the text, and I'm over here now, so it's not in the Bible. It doesn't tell me this for sure. But I believe a significant change had taken place in Isaac's thinking, in his heart, in his mind. Up until then, circumstances had shaped most most of his decision-making processes. But now something deeper and more noble seems to be giving direction to his life. Personally, I believe that Isaac went up to Beersheba because he sensed on a spiritual level that this is where God ultimately wanted him, in the land. And if God had been previously driving Isaac from place to place through circumstances, now I think Isaac somehow in between verse 22 and verse 23 is saying, I think I'm willing to be led. And the Lord appears to Isaac and speaks to him once again, affirming that he is with him and I'm sure that God's presence led him to do what was next they settled and they said you know what we're going to build an altar and we're going to set our tents we're going to land here so they do that go on in the text when Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahuzath his advisor and Phicol the commander of his army Isaac said to them why have you come to me seeing that you hate me and has sent me away from you. And they said, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us. And let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we've not touched you and have done you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. And in the morning they rose early, exchanged oaths. And Isaac sent them on their way, and they departed from him in peace. That same day, Isaac's service came to him and told him about the well that they had dug and said to him, We have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Interesting. One more well. The big well. I'm sure Isaac's question of Abimelech was logical. Why in the world are you coming to me now? All you guys have done is pushed me around and and been envious of me and jealous. You filled up my wells. Why are you coming now? He had every reason to believe that he wasn't going to have a great relationship with the Philistines. But notice the reason giving. Out of Abimelech's own words, and I think the Lord is putting those words in, the Lord is putting those words in Abimelech's mouth. We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. And so they make a pact, and they seal that pact with a covenant or an oath. 
And Isaac commemorated this by naming the well again, the, the water that they found, after the na same name that Abraham at one time gave it, which was Sheva. The name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Sheva can mean one of two things, either seven or oath. I choose to believe that it means oath, the city of the oath, because that's where they signed the pact. Isaac knew that the Lord had been with him, the Lord was with him, and the Lord would continue to be with him as he settled in Beersheba, and he, he was able to then confirm it with a covenant. Now, when we come to the last few verses of, of chapter 26, I kind of scratched my head at first. It says, verse 34, when Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Barry, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Bazimoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. What you'll learn very quickly is that Esau neither desired the blessing of God nor did he dread the curse of God. He flat out didn't care. The author of Hebrew tells us a little bit about something when he encourages us to think about how we relate to other people. And he says, strive for peace, everyone, in, in Hebrews 12, 14 through 16. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a meal. He made life very difficult for his parents because he just flat out didn't care about God. And this, it made life bitter. It probably caused their hearts to break. And I don't know about you, but I can speak from personal experience, very personal experience. There is nothing, nothing more painful than to have one of your kids walk away from God, to walk away from the Lord. It's tough. But what's the point? Why these verses at the end of chapter 26? Well, because... I believe he's saying God is with you in every moment, even of your heartache. Even when your heart's broken, God is there. God was with Isaac in his weakness. He was with Isaac in his success. He was with Isaac in his conflict. And now he's even with Isaac in his heartache. And you know what? God is with you in all of these situations, in every moment, in every situation that you live. And how you respond to his presence in your life in these situations will determine how well that you will live your life. God assures us that he's with us in every moment, in every situation. For those of us that know Jesus Christ is our personal Savior, Jesus, before he went back to be with the Father, he assured us that he was going to give us his presence in the person of his Holy Spirit. Listen to John chapter 14. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and I will be in you. What's really incredible when you think about the presence of God is isn't just God the Father, when you think of Yahweh in the book of Genesis, but we need to recognize that the triune God is present in the person of the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah, and what does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, after he gives the Great Commission? Lo, I will be with you always. So I believe what we, ha what we see out of this chapter is that the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are with you in every moment, in every situation, in your weakness, in your success, in your conflict, and even in your heartache. But the real question as we close is, how do we take advantage of that presence? How do we, in the words of Brother Lawrence, who wrote the book, which I would suggest you download from Kindle or get, it's really short, it's a great book. How do we practice the presence of God? How do we make a habit of being aware and responding to God's presence? Well, some of the things we probably, you're already answering for me. Well, we do it through prayer, we do it through worship, we do it through meditation. 
But, you know, you can also do it just by sitting out on a patio chair this evening and just being quiet and looking up and allowing God to let you know he's there. And if you open your heart to that, he will in one form or another. You can also try this this week. Every one of us has to get up. Every one of us has to take a shower before we go to work, right? Well, this week when you get up, before getting out of bed or while you're in the shower, get a verse of scripture that you can remember because you don't want to take your Bible into the shower with you. It'll get wet, okay? And run through a passage of scripture that talks about God's presence. Psalm 139, Psalm 23, Colossians chapter 3. That's a little long one. You can, you can pick whatever you want to. But, you know, we usually get ready for our days mindlessly, most of us. This is a way where you can actually purposely make a habit of practicing the presence of God by simply allowing the scriptures to speak to you, and you will sense that. You know, after six weeks, they say it becomes a habit, and you'll keep doing it for a long time. As you go this morning, <clears throat> I want to do a couple of things. Number one, I want you to take the assurance of God that he's with you in every moment, in every situation. And the next, I want you to live according to two words this week and next week and the week after. They're two Latin words. They're very simple. Coram Deo. Live your life in the presence of God. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to pray. I'm going to ask everybody to stay in their chair and not run out because they have to serve. Well, not because you want to get in line for the fruit kebabs. Not because you're afraid you're not going to get out of the parking lot and you might have to wait a couple of minutes for the, the traffic to go. I want us just to spend just a moment, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, practicing the presence of God. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes. Already, your mind is wandering. Shut that all off and think of these words from the God of the universe. I am with you. Allow yourselves to hear those words and then let your mind and heart go where the Spirit of God is going to take it. And if something comes in from the outside, shut it away. And just practice the presence, recognizing that he is with you even in these next 30 seconds.